good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome CRCDS family and friends. Um, our Bartlett lecture, unauthorized prophetic and pastoral utterances that touch the ground. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Lisa Thompson, and she is the assistant professor of homiletics. She is an ordained minister at the National Baptist Church, where she is also a leader of African American homiletics. Dr. Thompson earned her MA and PhD in religion from Vanderbilt University and an MDiv from Fuller Theological Seminary. Recently, she was elected as the president of African American Caucus of the Academy of Homiletics. Her publications include now that's preaching. Disruptive and generative preaching practices. In search of our mother's healing, holistic well-being, black women and preaching, and forthcoming sacred images, black women and the practice of preaching. I hope you're all looking forward to a wonderful word from our speaker. I introduce to you Dr. Lisa Thompson. <laughs> 
Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm always hesitant to play the full length of that clip, but also on days like these, I'm reminded of how quickly lives pass us by in the midst of natural disasters, human created catastrophes, um, and all the more mindful of why we don't do this just for the sake of talking about ideas. Um, mm -hmm. And that honestly, we need to think seriously about how our preaching and theological practices are more and more removed from the ground or how close we need to actually get to the ground to make an impact. I want us to hold on to that clip just in the back of our minds. I'll come back to it near the end of our time together. I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much to President McMickle, Dean Suave, and the lecture committee, as well as all the people who have been so hospitable to me in getting to Rochester. Um, for our time today, I want to share something of the title Unauthorized, Prophetic and Pastoral Utterances on the Ground. And I will say a bit about this piece. This is a piece that I was working on and, and have worked on for in honor of a previous colleague, mentor, um, and advisor, the Reverend Dr. Del P. Andrews, who we lost this summer. And the piece is really in the piece, I'm really trying to beg questions of how does the pulpit, does the church, does our work around preaching need to take seriously the places in which God might be moving in the world and speaking where we might not readily look or listen. Um, so there are a few movements that for our time together. So I'll do a little bit and open it up for conversation and discussion. I'm more so dropping ideas and would love to have some conversation around them. Um, I always say that theological education and religion is contextual and we all do it from a place of context. So I cannot deny that my roots are black religiosity in the American South. <laughs> um, and I think that that's important because the smaller we begin, the more narrow we begin, I think the better we're able to then make broader strokes or generalizations about then what needs to be done or what needs to happen or what we might ought should do. So I say that to say it will come up a bit while we're speaking. And there are a couple major movements I want us to think about. One, are we still concerned with pastoral and prophetic preaching today? And in what ways? Is the nature of prophetic and pastoral preaching somehow different than it was in past times, or does it need to be different? Um, to whom or to what is prophetic preaching accountable? And then where do we need to be looking if we think about the ultimate end of preaching as proclamation or the inbreaking of God, then where might that be possible in places where we might not have readily looked? Um, and so I take up the image of the mortal in the Valley of Dry Bones and lay the mortal alongside of what I call other sites or valleys in our world today to say, might these be instances of proclamation that we really need to consider and then what might we learn or what might we do differently if we take them seriously? The particular site I'm looking at recently is the Black Lives Matter movement. Right? So controversial for some, not for others. But what, what's kind of the fruit around this protest or these recent protest movements that may we prick our ears of those interested in theology and religion that actually touches the ground? So I'll just begin here a bit with considering the question what is the nature of prophetic preaching that is pastoral in the pursuit of bringing together a world of justice and reconciliation <coughs> remains a worthy endeavor today in 2017. In some ways, I propose that we do not learn more about the possibility or preaching that holds together prophetic and pastoral nature by simply kind of con continually revisiting the false divides between pastoral and prophetic, right? So let me say that one more time. <laughs> Often kind of in the conversation, we revisit, oh, well, is it pastoral or is it prophetic preaching? And I want to contend that we don't really get further by just exploring that divide alone, nor that false dichotomy alone. Um, the potential to learn more about the texture, what I want to call fateful utterances, to the world in which we live, in the midst of our everyday life, is in our willingness to give attention to sites that actually care for the soul and is, as it is inextricably connected to bodily existence, right? 
So not just in revisiting false divides, but actually looking at the places where something, someone is speaking faithfully <laughs> to the way in which people move about in the world based on where they take up space in the world. Um, these sites involve those that extend well beyond traditional pulpit spaces and their authorized voices. At every juncture, these sites are contextual and attend to the particularities of concrete lived experiences. These are the places where we as human beings simultaneously encounter all that is no less than good right alongside of all that is no less than evil in our midst. Life is contextual, and as I said, that which responds to life must be contextual, even theological and religious paradigms. As for me, I was shaped and formed in black religious traditions of the United States. These traditions were significant for the black women of my youth as they made sense of life in the world in which they lived. I'm going to come back to contending that in some ways black women have always been unauthorized voices in some of our spaces. This included living in defiance of the ways in which economic, racial, and gender dynamics of a complicated history of the U.S. Southern states in particular and the U.S. in general landed square and center in their lives and upon their bodies. Faith for these women had its accountability in the world as they knew it, not necessarily in the by and by. These women were often in traditions that did not affirm them as individuals authorized to preach, those of my youth. And yet they were undoubtedly mediators of revelatory occasions and experiences. With or without acknowledgement from the proper structures, the black women of my youth divided wisdom and truth for the community. These occasions now did not take place necessarily in the pulpit space. Where did they take place? They often took place around the kitchen tables, carpools to the textile mills for work, canning vegetables, and crop gathering. This dispelling of wisdom and truth was grounded in the world they knew, the faith they claimed, and the belief in a right to live a belief in the right to live. Their declarations were those that possessed the nature of what it meant to care for black life and transform what the existential realities of black life brought with it. The most faithful utterances of these women and for these women were not just those declared to them, but those that they themselves uttered, right? echoing that which they deem necessary for their own moving about in the world. So it's not just about some, what someone else tells me is supposed to be significant and sacred to me, but it's also what I discern, what I wisely discern as divine and holy that's sacred to me. These were the utterances they offered in the freedom of their own spaces and on their own terms. Don't give me the pulpit space, that's fine, but by I am shucking corn at the table, I'm going to do some divining of my own, right? So Del P. Andrews and Robert Lyndon Smith contend that practical theologies that support black life are those that are useful on the ground in a direct conversation with black life on the ground. If we take this claim seriously, then our next work is to seek out proclaimers on the ground who are in direct conversation with black life. If we take this claim seriously, this is our next work. We ordinarily think of on the ground and preaching on the ground um, as, I don't know, someone who's has an ear to the world and still connected to pulpit spaces. I wanna take us a step further today and say, yes, this is true. However, the pulpit is still one step removed from the ground for many, if we were to be honest. The way in which the most minoritized in a community are engaged in facilitating faithful speech is significant because they often exist at the deepest fissures of life and the world. I'm gonna say that one more time. The way in which the most minoritized in a community 
engage in facilitating faithful speech is significant because they often exist at the deeper fissures of injustice and life in the world. Their ability to affirm and mediate right-fitting utterances intonates toward that which is most needed when attending to holistic preaching, right? preaching that is both pastoral and prophetic. And yet, we must contend with the fact that these bodies and voices are often most marginalized from pulpit spaces. Still, the, the spaces we have deemed authoritative and homiletic discourse, right? I say homiletics, you say preaching, you think pulpit. The rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and its subsequent iterations provides a unique convergence of circumstances for considering demands upon preaching that attends to the work of justice and reconciliation in the 21st century. In conversation with Black Lives Matter, what I'll do with the rest of our time is explore the nature and ends of utterances that are faithful to the theological and ethical aims of proclamation itself as they exist outside of the pulpit and are carried forth by unauthorized voices. I contend that these unauthorized voices have resonance with the voice and the task of proclamation that's been entrusted to the mere mortal who proclaims in the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 37. Here, proclamation is considered an occurrence that destabilizes the very entities that makes it possible. In other words, proclamation is the hope for end in preaching, but by no means is it sequestered to preaching and the practice of preaching. These sacred intonations are those that provide care for the individual and her state of existence in ways that make room for the world to transform into a place that offers nothing less than life abundant for all the created of God. So I always get a little bit of ver um, reverberations when I say proclamation <laughs> is the hope for thing in preaching but not only sequestered to preaching nor guaranteed in preaching. How many have heard the sermon that wasn't quite preaching? You can raise your hand. Yes. <laughs> so you get my point. There are spaces in which where we expect proclamation to occur, which it does not occur. And yet, <laughs> other places where we might not expect truth to occur and we hear the ah, amen. That's word, that's word for us. So let me say a word about destabilizing utterances. Sacred utterances cannot be confined to particular containers and tropes as they bubble up when and however they choose to appear. <coughs> truth does not wait its turn. We recognize truth and affirm its presence when we experience it. It is an encounter. Here the reference to truth simply refers to that which is discerned as right fitting by a community and possesses the authority to shape the ways in which we make meaning of life and name belief, as it yields the potential to reshape our course of life. Okay? We often speak of these revelatory occasions through preaching as God's word or word of God. These encounters with significant utterances are encounters with proclamation itself. Proclamation has an effect and makes way for an experience as it generates and conjures forth something. For instance, authentic proclamation is not a description of inspiration, belief, or empathy. Somehow in the presence of authentic <coughs> proclamation, we experience the thing of, the intangible thing of inspiration, belief, and empathy. It kind of brings it forth into our very presence, the thing that's intangible. We actually have an encounter with it in the presence of proclamation. That which is familiar is made use of in often imaginative ways to disclose, unveil, or name what eludes being named. The community recognizes or bears witness to the moment of proclamation when it occurs, 
it functions in a mode of call and response. So something kind of calls out, rings out, and something else rings back. And this this echo of reverberation, yes, that's it. That's proclamation. That's the moment. And the proclaimer relies on a type of imaginative precision that affords their ability to meet listeners right where they are. This is an act that is dependent on God, and it's an act that is dependent on community. Both have to be involved. Preaching is dependent upon God to transform the fragility of human speech into something recognizable as viable and true. The spirit moves where and how she chooses. Just as preaching is dependent upon God, so too is every medium that somehow moves beyond the fragility of its working parts to stir our very beings. That medium that affords the presence of proclamation is incidental to a degree, as in not the primary concern nor necessary for its appearance, but instead just that a medium. To this end, such utterances naturally destabilize our ability to systematically categorize and predict what makes way for their existence in our midst if we allow them. If, we, if I could guarantee every sermon was word of God, I would do it. <laughs> but I just can't systematically calculate it, right? To a degree. When we encounter that which we deem as true, it reaches our deepest places of knowing and intuiting. The moment echoes backward forward to what we have known and know, whether the moment is in conversation, in prayer, or sitting in the midst of a musical performance. And yet our expectations of proclamation, including its shape and form, have conditioned our expectations of when and how it shows up in our midst. What does that mean? We expect sermon and scriptures to somehow reveal sacred utterances of what we typically call word of God. And that expectation often limits our openness to experiencing proclamation in its other sites of appearance, particularly when those sites are non-traditional or have not been necessarily authorized by communities of faith. For instance, one might often seek to discern God's presence in a sermon, but not so readily through the encounter of a novel. If we earnestly believe that the spirit cannot be confined by her utterances, nor her utterances, it then seems that we cannot ignore the utterances that spurred from a movement pioneered by queer black women in the summer of 2013. Theirs are some of the most fringe voices in our faith communities, and yet they found their resonance in life on the ground. I'll come back to somehow they found their resonance in life on the ground in ways that some of our sermons have yet to resonate on the ground. The gestures of this movement managed to find and facilitate alternative pulpits and talk back to what we consider the purposes and shape of faithful speech. These voices push us to re-examine both the presumed sites and nature of proclamation. So I want to talk a bit about the mortal of the valley, in the valley, um, as we move to think about the Black, Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement in some of its iterations. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, we see humanity existing at the fissures of life or more aptly, lingering somewhere between existing and not existing at all. The reader is introduced to a valley of dry bones. The mortal has been transported to the valley to observe, give an account of that observation, and then speak. Ultimately, the mortal is called not to speak back to God, but to speak to the valley itself. The final conclusion of the vision is that the spoken witness will be both for the bones of the valley and for the observers to know what has occurred. Namely, that the promise to the created of God is confirmed as no less than the full life-giving spirit of God as she moves through these bones and as they move through the world. <laughs> 
In this strange passage of a whirlwind vision and slippage between real time and otherworldly time, we see something about the one who proclaims, the state of human existence and the nature of utterances the Holy One authorizes in this encounter. The mortal comes face to face with the fragmented experiences between body and spirit. This fragmentation is a desolate valley of dislodged bones absent of breath. After the mortal is given the first directive to speak to the bones, they come together with a noise, a rattling. As the mortal squints and looks closer, he recognizes that even as the bones seem upright and connected, they are not yet alive. They can't breathe. They cannot inhale the full breath that comes from the four corners of the earth. In the valley, the mortal is contending with the presence of the imitation of life, namely that which mimics or intonates toward life and yet is not the fullness of life. And again, he is directed to prophesy and call forth life that which exists outside the bones to come and take up habitation. The Holy One says, prophesy to the breath. The utterance itself teeters at the brink of present existence and new possibilities of existence. The present existence is the imitation of life. The possibilities of existence are life abundant. Both the bones of the valley and the breath of life respond and affirm the veracity of the call made out to them. This is the give and take exchange and proclamation. There is a calling out and there is a response. The mortal has an encounter that shapes his ways of knowing and intuiting and seems to be transported back to real time and given the task to speak to the house of Israel. The bones are the house of Israel suffering and exile. The created of God are saying our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. A segment of humanity is in a fractured existence and cut off from the vitality of life. Their laments are echoes of what they have once known in part to be no longer being at all, life. We are cut off implies that the current experience is not as it should be or as it could be. They can't breathe. The opening of chapter 37 might be read as no less than an invitation to participate with the Holy One in responding to the now lived trauma of the house of Israel. The invitation is in the form of a question, honestly, I think, can these bones live mortal? The mortal shrinks back in human finitude and limitation, it almost seems, as we read the chapter of knowledge, answering, oh, only you know, Holy One. <laughs> And then he witnesses what gives experiential knowledge of not only the answer, but also his role in fulfilling the risky gap of declaration, the risky gap of proclamation. Ezekiel is confronted with the task of calling forth life in ways that gather up and attend to the lost pieces. <clears throat> But first, the mortal must dare to name the absence of life and the imitation of life. The mere human must name what evades being named and call forth that which remains elusive. This is an act of discerning between life that still intonates the rattling of death and life that intonates the abundance of spirit. The proclaimer speaks to both the acute cries, cries and crises of lament that exude from real bodies and the corporate vision of life abundant, the personal and the pastoral, the personal and the prophetic, the individual and the corporate. Now, if we take this seriously, 
In the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel is not called priest or prophet, but simply mortal. And the one whose ordinary humanity is constant, and the one to whose ordinary humanity is constantly referred is entrusted what is ultimately the work of proclamation. Not priest, not prophet, and this vision, but mortal. The utterances in the valley name the absence of life, speak to the promise of life, and proclaim nothing less than the fullness of life. This is a large promise in the context of everything that denies life while affirming death. This is a large promise in the wake of natural disaster, unneeded shootings, unneeded lynchings in the 21st century. It's a large promise. And yet, this is the intonation of sacred speech as it arises in our midst and as it arises in the valley. These are the utterances that call out and to which we respond as holy. So now I would like to take a look briefly at kind of where we sit now in time in the 21st century and unauthorized iterations of proclamation. The proclamation of the valley has theological and ethical impulses, for sure. These utterances have overtures that affirm the sanctity of life as a continuation of God's breath. They simultaneously affirm that trauma, death, and suffering and exile do not reflect the full promise of life's possibilities. The proclaimer affirms the recognition of what should not be even as they co-create the fruition of life in the contradictory locale of death amidst the groans of creation. Furthermore, the utterances of the valley give care for human existence. Simultaneously, they are part of transforming human existence. They give care for human existence, yet they are part of transforming, creating something new within human existence, and are predicated upon a give and take, call and response. If we attend first to the theological and ethical aspects of proclamation, we might both recover sites of utterances wherever they show up today, while giving more attention to our modalities of expression preaching or otherwise. And therefore, continuity with the hopes of proclamation itself. If it does the work that we think proclamation should do, why not call it holy work also? More specifically, beginning with the nature of proclamation opens up the possibility of understanding those utterances that reach to the edges and depths of black life when and where they break into our lived domain. Proclamation that sustains black life considers black life and that which is required for its flourishing as well as that which prevents its flourishing. In a society that is anti-black, this itself is what makes such proclamation pastoral, prophetic, justice, and reconciliation oriented in nature. This includes their presence in forms other than what is perceived as traditional, practical, theological containers. So in 2013, Black Lives Matter began populating social media threads, t-shirts, conversations, posters, signs, protest signs, and media streams. Alicia Garza, Apol Tamiri, and Patrice Cullors created the phrase and hashtag as they describe in their words after 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was posthumously placed on trial for his own murder and the killer, George Zimmerman, was not held accountable for his crime he committed. It was a response to the anti-black racism that permeates our society and also, unfortunately, our movements." End quote. The work in protest of Black Lives Matter is a response to anti-black racism while affirming the sanctity of all black lives across its spectrum of existence 
decentering the historical attention given to cisgender, heterosexual black men, even in black liberation movements. At the rise of its inception, Black Lives Matter responded to the brutal deaths of black people, often at the hands of law enforcement officers. These deaths were and are often met with sentiments that assumed the disposability of black life, including a lack of criminal convictions, delayed investigations, and a lack of provocation by the victims that matched the outcomes of their death. In contrast to anti-black sentiments, Black Lives Matter is a complete sentence. Black Lives Matter is a complete sentence and thought that prepares forward a counter narrative to pervasive social narratives and beliefs that black lives do not matter and are insignificant to the point that they are indeed dispensable. These anti-black narratives lump black life into a monolithic story that dismisses the humanity and sanctity of such lives and instead replaces sanctity of life and humanity with sentiments that support unjust practices that have the death of black life as their final end. To be sure, Black Lives Matter is a form of calling out to justice attends to the personal and corporate traumas of black life while trying to build a way forward in a world deplete of justice by black people, or for black people, rather. To this end, the spurs of protest, be it song, hashtags, anthems, rally cries, or dance in the midst of valleys of death, are all forms of proclamation or have the potential to be forms of proclamation that demonstrate greater connections with what we typically have codified as prophetic preaching than some aspects of preaching that continue from our pulpit spaces. These myriad expressions of the movement, its sister movements, and unaffiliated yet responsive aesthetic works are often led by voices considered unauthorized by traditional power structures including those of the historical black liberation movement, church, and society. And yet their reverberations might be those of proclamation. Singer and artist Janelle Monet, is part of the producer of the clip we heard coming in, and writer ta Coates are two windows into both the pastoral and prophetic aspects of utterances far beyond the pulpit space. In the clip we were listening to, Janelle Monet and other artists from her record label, Wonderland, released an anthem entitled, Hell You Talking About? In the summer of 2015, the anthem came on the heels of the killing of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and a wave of others that summer and before. The song is undergirded by the beat of the drum and the chants that resemble the practices of hymn lining. The lyrics are almost non-existent, only consisting of repetitively chanting the title as a refrain. Hell you talking about, hell you talking about. The verses are interludes, not sung, but <clears throat> spoken and shared by two voices. One calls out a name and the other says, say her name. One calls out a name and the other responds, say his name listing names from Emmett Till in the history down to Sandra Brand of the contemporary time. Their cries of persistence are similar to the declaration surrounding the time and determination to place names with faces of black women and black men who have been killed. The cries evoke the memory of life and the inability to deny the discernible pattern of death or the absence of life. In a similar trajectory, and the same summer as Monet, as Monet but through a different medium, Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates sorry, published Between the World and Me, framed as a letter to his son. The book is, brutally intimate, is a brutally intimate account of how systemic anti-black racism functions in the US and eventually finds a place to land upon and break individual black bodies. <laughs> 
I'm going to read an excerpt from Coates. Beginning of quote. There is nothing uniquely evil in these destroyers or even in this moment. The destroyers are merely men enforcing the whims of our country correctly interpreting its heritage and legacy. This legacy aspires to the shackling of black bodies. It's hard to face this, but all our phrasing, race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscles, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must never look away from this. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the aggressions all land with great violence upon the body. I read this quote much differently when I have the images of Charleston in the backdrop of our mind now. Before it was vivid, but there's a different way in which is vivid even more two or three months later. In hell you talking about, the listener could hear the unrelenting cries, anger, terror, defiance, and grief in the artist's voices. In between the world and me, the reader observes these sentiments as they move across the page. Both Coates and Wonderland artists attested to the threat and reality of disembodiment and erasure of black bodies in North America, as well as the anger, frustration, and sadness of such realities. However, it is the movement of writing, singing, speaking and saying that we need to consider. These are the actions that led and push an experience of truth into our current domain of existence that at times eluded and continues to elude being named. There's a way in which Monet and Coates were able to gain the attention, gain the ear and the hearts and the minds and even the trauma of listeners that we have yet to sometimes be able to gain through our pulpits and sermons. These movements are movements that lend towards life and freedom or have the possibility to in the midst of an unsatisfying and death dealing world. The movements of writing, singing, speaking, and scribing are similar to those captured as Images, I'm sorry, are similar to those captured as images such as Aisha Evans standing alone, you've seen her, in a ballerina dress in front of the police battalion, placing her body in front of a battalion full of riot gear. These movements of the voice, pen, and body are confessional, is what I would argue. Their work is the action of holding together the tension of erasure of personhood, yet underscoring personhood, right? You are erasing personhood with these actions. And yet we are here to also underscore your erasure or attempt to erase and the viability of this personhood, the vitality of this personhood. Their actions to inscribe names, experiences, and the reality of black lives in the context of North America is not only an inscription of reality, but somehow a calling forth or into a new reality through aesthetic mediums. The new reality is the possibility of life abundant as opposed to life deficient. These contemporary proclaimer prototypes leverage imaginative precision, which is something coined by Ellen Davis in her exploration of preaching in the Old Testament, and their utterances, just as the proclaimers of old and meet the imaginations of their listeners and observers in ways that preaching has sometimes failed to do. To be sure, death, despair, and trauma are not the only thematics of black life. They are accompanied by joy, hope, and laughter, just as any situated human experience. And yet the history of black life in the midst of narratives of conquest colonialism and enslavement prove a particular tension between hope and despair, 
grief and joy, and laughter and tears in the black thematic universe. These protests, utterances, actually attend to the aspects of the fullness of what it means to be black and move about in the world as bodies under constant threat that need to be reclaimed as human and sacred. They have pastoral dimensions, while they also insist upon a different vision for life here and now. In this regard, the utterances of protest are both pastoral and prophetic, helping black life both claim its vitality in the midst of denial of such and claiming black life as such to those who are indirect and indirect interlopers of black life. So kind of my final thoughts before I ask or think about questions is the quest of faithful responses, excuse me, for the purposes of social engagement is not a new question for us in 2017 by any means, or a new question to faith communities isolated to the 21st century. And yet every era brings with it a unique convergence of circumstances that are connected to that time and its present day scenarios. The work of prophetic preaching remains both consistent across time, even as it has different textures across time and shades across time. Our decision to reassess continually what it means to be faithful assumes that the task of preaching and its hoped for aim of proclamation remains accountable to contemporary context and contemporary communities. I had a mentor you say, it ain't the gospel if it don't carry. So we have to think seriously. Still like Brad Braxton, if he asks. <laughs> the work of preaching that seeks to build bridges between the prophetic and pastoral for the sake of justice and reconciliation has to first begin translating the everyday life world as a matter of faith the everyday life world as a matter of faith, not as something that's tangential or separate from faith. Yes. However, in that translation, but we're, before we can move to language of reconciliation, we must first correct injustice by the way of justice-oriented practices. That means we may bristle at say his name or say her name. That means we may bristle at Black Lives Matter. That means we may bristle at safe water protests and passages. But the work of justice has to be done before we can speak about reconciliation. This correction involves attending to both the ways in which injustice affects us as individuals and at the corporate level. What is more, Proclamation that attends to this correction holds together pastoral and prophetic dimensions, including that which lends to joy and sorrow, hope and despair, laughter and tears, and most importantly, life and death. We cannot say that we are preaching prophetically if we are not attending to both life and death, care for the soul and care for the corporate. Proclamation continually stirs our imaginings to the eschatological echoes that breach our walls from time to time. The divine and human exchange in the valley continues to ripple throughout the world today, even in, the, in some of the most unexpected locales, such as valleys, the corners of street protests, and the plains of discord. If we are attentive to the hopes of proclamation, we might be more attentive to where and how it shows up. Even those voices that are deemed unauthorized, untidy, and more traditional understandings of church and religious life. Such openness yields the possibility to explore the place multiple streams of proclamation. I'm sorry, such, such openness yields the possibility of exploring and place multiple streams of proclamation in conversation with one another, yielding a greater impact on our faith practices as a whole. Spoken word might speak to the harmonies of song, preaching may attend to the overtures of protest, and protest might be genuine care for the soul. Here we may witness all that is sacred disclosed anew 
and the most everyday circumstances and utterances. These are the places that build bridges between sometimes divides or ideals of how we intonate to a world established through justice that leads to reconciliation. Visiting these sites of disclosure helps us more readily attend to preaching as its hopes is nothing less than proclamation and as the hope of proclamation is nothing less than a counter with sacred and breaking. And we have to affirm that all that is sacred is all that gives life. Thank you. Thank you.